Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me here today. I'm Ellen Nakashima, uh, reporter with The Washington Post, and I'm moderating the panel on uh, exposing Kremlin's information operations, influence operations. I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, to my left is Ambassador John Herbst. He directs the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center as a retired, highly decorated career foreign service officer, including a tour as U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, and has written extensively on Central Asia, Ukraine, and Russia. And, and to his left is, is Laura Galante, a leading authority on cyber threats, information operations, and intelligence analysis. She's the founder of Galante Strategies, and her recent work has included developing a cybersecurity framework for the Ukrainian government. Next to her is Arnoldus Picturness, an advisor to the Prime Minister of Lithuania for national security, and he can speak to Lithuania's experience with Kremlin's uh, influ influence operations and lessons learned. And we have Dr. Alina Polyakova, a foreign policy fellow at the Brookings Institution Center on the U.S. and Europe, and an adjunct professor of European studies at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. So the topic of the Kremlin's influence operations has a particular resonance for me because in June of 2016, I broke the story of the Russian hack of the Democratic National Committee. And I distinctly remember at the time that this was a big you know, front page story, sort of Watergate, uh, you know, the, the Watergate break in all over again, but in the information age. And everyone thought that this was classic espionage, st uh, strategic political espionage, Russians hacking into the political uh, uh, campaign of a, you know, the party to try to figure out what they could about the potential next president of the United States and what opposition uh, papers they might have on, on the Republicans. And then a few weeks later, on the eve of the Democratic National Convention, Russia dumped 20,000 hacked emails out onto the internet on WikiLeaks. And all of a sudden, I knew, and it became evident immediately to, to people who follow this area, that this was no longer just a uh, you know, hack for traditional espionage. Russia had taken it to a new level. All of a sudden, we were in sort of seeing information warfare. I remember Mike Hayden saying, if this is Russia, they've taken it to a new level. This is uh, weaponizing information. And that whole summer was one uh, spent ju just with the federal government, the US government, struggling to decide whether to, because it was clear it was Russia, whether to call out Russia, what to do about it, how to respond. And they finally did in October. But my, you know, how far we've come in, in two years. So anyway, I'm very interested to hear the, the thoughts of our panel of experts here as to what we've learned in two years, what, what solutions can we bring to bear on this challenge? And I'd like to start with a baseline question to John. Uh, talk to us, tell us, how is the Kremlin using influence operations to advance its strategic policy goals with respect to the United States? And how successful has it been in the last two years in meeting those goals? All right. Uh, I would actually like to broaden your question sure. a little bit. I thought I made it broad, but go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> and talk about Kremlin main objectives overall. Okay. I mean, disinformation is not something new. Uh, although the extent of it and the application of it in a new world of cyber operations and social media is new. But it all starts with, with the very fact that Moscow has chosen a revisionist policy. It wants to turn upside down the world order that was created, certainly at the end of the Cold War, but you could even say going back to the end of World War II. An order based upon sovereignty of nations, territorial integrity, the right of nations to choose not just their own domestic systems, but their alliances. The Kremlin says no. The Kremlin says no. It says that it wants a new world order. At the famous Valdai conferences, which is the Kremlin version of Davos, They've had signs on the wall which say, world order, new rules or no rules, as broad as, as large as the letters right behind us right here. And Kremlin policy has pursued this. They claim they deserve, they require a sphere of influence. On a minimum, 
on the territory of the former Soviet Union, if not beyond the Soviet Empire. And they have established goals of weakening uh, the EU, weakening NATO, weakening the transatlantic relationship. And that means the relationship between the United States and Europe. And that includes weakening the major pillars of these relationships, which means the United States, it means Germany, it means France, it means interfering in their elections. Now, how does disinformation come in? Well, it's actually pretty simple. The goals that I just described, and they're not hidden. Uh, Mr. Putin says something along these lines every few months. Go back to his famous Munich speech from February of 2007, and you'll see it. Uh, while they don't hide it, they really don't want us to pay attention to it. And so disinformation operations are designed to keep us in the dark as they pursue these objectives. Now, there's an old Russian word. It was very popular in Soviet times, maskirovka, which is to mask your intentions. And this is the modern version of maskirovka. And some of the same techniques that were developed over decades by the Soviet Union, and information operations predate the Soviet regime in Moscow. I mean, the protocols of the elders of Zion was a particularly nasty form of disinformation. And that was done by the Ahrana, the Tsar's secret police. In any case, the operations have certain common features. For example, I'm sure that anyone in this audience knows that the United States created AIDS as part of a biological weapons campaign. This theme was developed by the Soviets in the mid-80s. It was called Operation Infection, meaning Operation Infection. The idea, the story was first planted in a newspaper in India called The Patriot. It was essentially owned by the Soviets. The small paper then was cited by other papers till it became a story. Of course, it was all nonsense, but the techniques were there. Now, uh, you have better experts on this on this panel to talk about how these things were applied today. But they've been effective. And they've been effective in part because the West has not been keen to note the challenges posed by Kremlin policy. I'd like to also add one yeah. other goal to that, that okay. the Kremlin has had, and I think that is, which we saw in vivid display in the last year or two, is to sow division and discord and to en en enhance Absolutely. polarization, of, uh, exploit existing divides, social, economic, political, and religious in the United States. And, and it was, in maybe in, in respect to that goal, I'd like to open it up to the panel. How successful has Russia been um, both in, in sowing discord and in uh, discrediting U.S. democracy uh, through its disinformation, amplification of divisive themes, uh, and, and other methods of influence operations. I'll, I'll start on that, Alan. I think that when you're, when you're trying to gauge the level of effectiveness or success of what the Kremlin has done for the last several years in particular, you have to start with what the ground uh, truth was at the time, and still is. We have a massively fragmented media environment that has changed rapidly before all of our eyes in the last few years. And that is a factor that has been incredibly important in how the operations, which Ambassador Herbst, Herbst um, traces back for, for you know, hundreds, almost 100 years now, right? But they have been effective, and these strategies have worked because we're dealing with an information environment that lacks the same types of gatekeepers that we were comfortable with or understood for years, right? So the fragmentation of the media environment is, is, is sort of ground condition one, right, as we're thinking about the effectiveness of this. The second piece to remember is while, while 2016 was the flashpoint for Americans getting, getting their first real taste of what modern information operations looked like, this took a decade of concerted modern effort to be any bit successful. Let's rewind a little bit back to 2007. Lithuania, you'll remember this well because it was, it was nearby. So in Estonia in 07, this Soviet soldier monument in the middle of Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, is taken down in the middle of the night by the Estonian government. And out comes this, we called it then, the patriotic hacker response in the Estonian government, which is one of the first kind of e-governments, is really taken to its knees, looting, um, you know, is, is in the streets. And, and Estonia is really kind of off the, off the grid for a few days. And this is 07, right? And 
this comes off in retrospect as this very kind of ham-handed attempt by the Kremlin to um, go after go after Estonia and after the Estonian government, and it really kind of is a has a whiplash effect. People in the West look at this and say, "Look at Russia as the aggressor," which was very much not how Russia wanted this event to come off. We'll go into Georgia. Almost the same thing happens with how they try to play Saakashvili at the time as this um, Nazi-like figure. And in you know, with perspective, this all looks like something where Russia and the Kremlin is coming off uh, with with their fingerprints all over these operations, right? So it took years of experimentation and the right ground conditions for this to start to work and to sort of seep into the information panorama, the domain that we were all living in, and disguise itself, it become that, have that Maskarovska um, effect that we're talking about. So um, I'll stop there, but I think those are, those are some of the pieces with which to judge these operations. Yeah, you mentioned the fragmentation of the media environment and what was going on in, in Eastern Europe, but I wonder, um, are we maybe a little different than, than they in that uh, we have a very active uh, um, domestic uh, you know, influence operation going on in a sense through the uh, extreme uh, political actors in you know, Infowars, for instance, and other um, just homegrown domestic media outlets. And how much of this, this discord and confusion is a result of what Russia did, and how much is a result of our own internal domestic actors? Alina? Just to follow yeah. up on that, um, I think you have kind of hit the nail on the head, and I just wanted to get right to it, uh, mainly because uh, what Laura was saying about the environment that we currently find ourselves in is completely true. This lack of gatekeepers that you mentioned, mm -hmm. editors, uh, they used to decide what we saw. Not everybody decides uh, they can post anything online. We all know this. Uh, social media companies decide what we see. Google decides what we see. Not editors of newspapers. Um, but I think we're talking about impact. And this, this, the question always comes up, how much of this is what we do to ourselves, mm -hmm. the kinds of trends we've seen not just in the media space, but in the political polarization of our societies where you see the growth on the fringes um, in Europe and the United States, the far left, far right political movements gaining more and more traction, a uh, thinning out of the center, um, the, the tensions that we already have in our societies around immigration, religion, uh, race and other social issues, they have become amplified, no question about that, through the uh, advent of the digital online media environment. So I think in that context, you know, we were vulnerable and we were ready, and the Kremlin was pushing on an open door. Uh, we, we should not give uh, Russia too much credit. I mean, we have to put it in the context of our own societies and, and the kinds of social trends and demographic and economic trends that we've seen here. And I think the reality is that uh, what the Russians were able to do uh, was amplify and magnify those divisions. And I think their biggest innovation was not technical. They were not savvy from a technical perspective. They didn't invent anything new. They didn't invent um, ad tools on Facebook or Google. Uh, they didn't invent micro-targeting. Uh, they just use these tools uh, basically as a PR campaign. So in the same way that you know Nike used Facebook, Twitter, um, et cetera, to market sneakers, uh, the Russians used this uh, to market divisions, right? And it was the exact same tools. Their biggest innovation, I think, and this is what makes it different from the Soviet days, in my view, uh, maybe even previously, as what uh, Ambassador Herbst was talking about, the biggest innovation was to completely throw out the whole notion of there being a single narrative or ideology. Mm -hmm. It was really to bombard the information space with what um, some colleagues of ours have called the fire hose of falsehood. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is the biggest innovation. I think for this reason, we're talking about impact. I'll just highlight a few things. You know, Ellen, just very quickly, you said, you know, we've gone, come so far yeah. um, in the last two years. In terms of understanding. Exactly, right. but this, this in right. effect, I think has been a positive impact. Yeah. You know, when Ukraine happened in 2014 and the kinds of propaganda information we saw around uh, the revolution in Ukraine uh, was unbelievable. And nobody cared. Trust me, nobody cared. 
But now everybody cares. Now we don't have to explain to people what disinformation is. Right. And now we are seeing a ramping up of governmental, civil society, and private sector efforts to combat it. Exactly. Arnold. I guess you know, uh, the one of the first ones to experience uh, that in, yeah. in, in, uh, at, at the first uh, term of Mr. Putin already, I guess. Uh, and at the time when Lithuania, the Baltic states, and Poland were speaking about that, we were seen as, as the uh, hysterical Easterners. And uh, suddenly now, after 10, 15 years, we see the same narratives here. But uh, that's, that's the thing that uh, Mr. Putin is testing its re his red lines. And we don't respond in the way that it would be painful enough for Russia. Mm -hmm. Because we see and we discuss about the disinformation. And we have to admit that Russia knows us much better than we know Russia. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And it's ready to use this, this knowledge against us. And uh, if we look uh, at what's the most important for the Kremlin's regime, it's the support of its financial groups. And the question for us, in, in Lithuania's case, one of the first decisions that we had to make, to say a clear no for the big investments coming from Russia's side. And, you know, I, I have a phrase that I constantly repeat wherever I go. So, if we'll have London grads all over, we might have Salisbury's again. So, that's our choice, whether we let in the closest uh, surrounding of Mr. Putin into our countries through dirty Russian investments, or we say a clear no, that's not our take, and we review the investments, we review the po general policy of dealing with Russia. Because disinformation is only the thing that is visible for us, and it's more or less easy to tackle via solutions in IT, whether uh, that's education tools or, or, or others. Yeah. But the question is whether we are ready to take real actions in order to change the strategy, not the forms of how Russia reacts, but uh, acts against it, but their the own strategy against the West. Are you in Lithuania uh, ready to, to change your strategy? Have you tried to say no to Russia, push back, impose costs, create pain such that they are stopping their bad behavior? You know, uh, for our case, that's simply a tool to protect our national interests in many cases. We had okay. um, just uh, a year, two years ago, uh, quite a large investment to IT sector, a data set, da da database uh, center. A proper Danish company with co-financing from US uh, funds. And if we would not have the strategic sectors investment clearance system, uh, we would not have known that uh, people standing behind the Danish attorney's uh, company that were dealing and, and signing all the papers, the officials uh, linked to GIU. And uh, also, also, you know, the networks, if they would have been allowed, they would have connected Lithuanian uh, IT sector, uh, technical uh, measures, to the Russian uh, agencies uh, tools that we But use. you disallowed that? We didn't allow okay. that, and it was a clear no to, to that investment. Many gotcha. offers to invest and build uh, centers somehow close to NATO uh, air bases or to the main port. Of course, that's a co attraction point, but uh, that's the <laughs> decision of, of the state, and of course, that's, that's a big thanks to our intelligence services. They do their work right and inform and, and government can take the decision not to allow such investments. But here, the main thing is that not allowing such type of investment, that's a political decision. Right. And the big question, whether our governments are ready to take that risk and, and take the decision. So that goes to the issue of strategic deterrence, and I wanted to discuss that for a little bit now. Uh, someone mentioned red lines. Um, and clear consequences. Uh, first, let me ask it this way, John. The, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration uh, imposed measures 
uh, against the Moscow in the wake of the um, 2016 election to include uh, economic sanctions, there were indictments, there were uh, you know expulsions and stuff of of of, um, of of agents, and um, some of that tied to the Skripal poisoning. Have any of those measures, in your eyes, been effective at changing Moscow's behavior? Well, if you if that's your only measure, you'd have to say they haven't been effective because the behavior hasn't changed. Uh, we've seen. Kremlin intervention in other elections since the intervention in ours, and for that matter, since our sanctions. But the sanctions that were imposed uh, largely at the initiative of Congress um, have been very powerful. And the sanctions list that came out, the administration finally put out this past spring, was very tough. The one on the oligarchs and yes. the So this, this will, is certainly having an impact on both the Russian economy and on friends of Putin. Over time, uh, this will probably influence behavior. But I think it's a success right now because when someone is coming after you, if you weaken them, you're doing yourself a big favor. And we should never forget that. Do you, do you think in order to, uh, to, to deter them, we need to, do, we need to have a, a more uh, explicit declaratory strategy or policy that says, thou shalt not meddle or, or compromise election um, machinery, for instance, or you sh thou shalt not hack and dump in the way they did with the DNC, and if you do, we will respond forcefully. Uh, you're nodding your head, Alina, do you want to take that one? Well, I mean, you just basically outlined a classic military deterrence strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is exactly how deterrence works in the military space and how the United States, uh, along with our European allies, were able to contain and deter the Soviet Union. Uh, during the Cold War. It was because there was a clear set of metrics, you do X, the consequence is Y, and neither side was willing to take the consequence, which at the time would have been nuclear war, most likely. And so the question is, how do we transfer this notion and uh, theory of deterrence into the digital age, into the cyber domain? Uh, one example um, that I'll just quickly note is this past spring, there was this, I think, quite stark uh, Department of Homeland Security and FBI report uh, that documented the same, they showed the same malware that had caused um, the electrical grid outages in Ukraine, uh, detected on the critical infrastructure systems in the United States, electrical grids, waterways, nuclear. Um, this was quite shocking to my mind. To me, it looked like the Russians had basically planted cyber bombs. I'd like to hear what uh, Laura thinks about that. So to my mind, you know, do we have something similar? Um, on the Russian, have uh, we planted our own cyber bombs? Yeah. Right. You know, I I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of this. Hopefully, we just don't know is already happening because it's happening in the classified space between intelligence agencies. But these are the kinds of uh, strategies and policies that I think we need to be thinking through because right now all we have are tactics and we don't have a strategic view, uh, the bigger picture of how we want to manage Russia. You just said we don't have a, a bigger whole of government clear strategic pi picture to manage Russia, and I guess to to spell out some of the red lines and and the consequences. Uh, could I ask what some of those red lines would look like for for you all? And do you think that we need to have uh, the president himself? Uh, come out pu publicly and support that strategy in order for it to to have an impact or take, be taken seriously? It's, it's, a, it's a big question. So let me, let me can start trying to unravel a couple thread. pieces of it. Yeah, pull, pull some different threads out of that. So I think um, it, Alina's raising critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, rightfully so here, right? And, and let's start on the easy stuff in a way that is, right? We need, we need to decide what we're going to deem uh, critical infrastructure and what we're going to deem as part of our very clear, almost sovereign, physical assets, right? An election infrastructure was not deemed critical infrastructure in 2016. It now is, right? So that's step one. Let's decide what falls under something that, if attacked or if compromised, would necessitate a US government response, right? That, that's, that's sort of an obvious, easy deterrent, right? And, and we've started to do that. Am I disturbed by that DHS report? Sure I am. Um, 
Are there you know, a variety of different types of reconnaissance efforts that governments worth their salt engage in on, on countries' uh, pain points, like their power grids and criti critical infrastructure? Of course, and that's been going on for you know, ages, right? Um, not to diminish the significance of that, but that, that you know, is, is sort of how, how things work, right? Um, if you go forward and then attack that critical infrastructure, a very different set of consequences come into play. So I, I think that's sort of, uh, you know, thread one where we need to think through how are the changing digital assets, um, how do the changing digital assets require our rethinking of what will necessitate US government response? Mm -hmm. Fine. When we get to the, this sort of whole of government approach, Ellen, that you're, that you're walking us towards, right, in, in how we think of, of defending against this, this really kind of multi-format threat, I almost think whole of government, even though that's a very broad and kind of wonky term, mm -hmm. misses actual the, the yeah. actual boat on this, it, and it's it's whole of society. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I'm and I'm again going for a jargony right. term on that, but I'm I'm saying whole of society because I think that's how Russia's playing this, right? And I think it's also um, a big enough term to encompass the fact that we're going to have to have to have the awareness and the um, uh, thoughtfulness of people far beyond government and military circles to start understanding the dimensions of the, the broader set of security concerns that we're going to be dealing with. And, and, and this is security with a small s, right? This is um, how do we think about teaching uh, critical thought of information sources in K through 12 elementary. This is how do you give librarians the tools to think about um, new ways of, of, of um, explaining information systems and how they work to you know a lot of people's main touch points with with the information world, which is the library, right? Um, those are you know a few here, but let's use this concept of asymmetry that we throw around in this space so often and extend it to some of our solutions here. This is how do we get society to have both the antidote from a thoughtfulness perspective to not fall for some of this disinformation and propaganda by giving people the tools and the instincts and the knowledge to be able to, to, to be empowered consumers of information. And that's, just, that's not just the government. I mean, that's, that's an enormous challenge and I think one that, that we've got to start grappling with in a, in a ton of different verticals. So the way I think about it is that, in fact, there needs to be a, a whole of society approach, and that includes government and a whole of government approach within that, but then also the private sector, also civil society, and we consumers and readers of information ourselves. And so all the solutions have to be kind of articulated within each of those sectors. We've heard a little bit of, of that in just one of the last panels. I think uh, someone mentioned just being more critical of what you read. Ask what is the source? Uh, what, what are, and if you can determine that it's coming from a, a foreign uh, malign source, what is, their, what is their goal or what is their motive? Think before uh, retweeting. Things, just little things like that. Um, but I wanted to know whether you in Lithuania had with all your years of experience, come up with, with tools or media literacy um, programs? Should these be made mandatory in American classrooms, for instance? Any thoughts on that? Um, I have to, to admit that still we are working on a mechanism that would be most efficient. But we are combining uh, the activeness of our civil society, the, the well-known uh, elves that are fighting on Facebook and Twitter, with uh, earlier uh, presented uh, Troll fa uh, Factory. Uh, also, we do have um, some good initiatives coming up from the media side, the debunking uh, platforms uh, that we are also offering our colleagues to join, simply scanning and detecting the most uh, commonly used uh, phrases uh, on, 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 on or propaganda from Russia's side, and uh, we had really good results when we, the, at a very early stage, articles were found and debunked and uh, already published uh, as a story of debunked uh, fakes, in, I guess it was in two hours' time. 
So from the release of fake news to uh, explaining to the public what's happening, it was in two hours' time. So that's a good result. And uh, we have to work with our partners to, to, you know, to, to install uh, French, German, and other languages into the platform simply to see the full scanning of, of a picture. Uh, as for resilience in schools, uh, you know, for us, teachers express very clearly they are afraid to discuss hot topics with students mm. in order not to be seen as po too political, mm. in many cases. Yeah. So a few years ago, we initiated, uh, initiated a tool for teachers, which is done by Vilnius University and partners, simply on the uh, twice a month hot topics uh, in the media and possible provocative questions for students how to analyze uh, the materials. So that's a, that are the small steps that we are doing. Uh, seeing uh, that uh, there's a clear shift of merge, merging cyber attacks with fake news, uh, actually in two weeks we are releasing an uh, information campaign in Lithuanian media. It, it will be high intensity, one and a half months, simply showing how this is being done and how can uh, media, uh, or how can fakes uh, affect pub public opinion? Because the things that we see that uh, there are attempts to hack into the major uh, media networks and implant uh, fake news into that. So that's, that's a scary tendency because it can create a serious uh, backlash from the society. So therefore, we have to be ready in advance. After the first tryouts, we are already informing the public. Just beware, be ready, just in case that happens. Uh, you mentioned that the, um, there was some reticence to, to take on hot topics in the classroom by teachers. And I'm thinking about um, the US and how we have such a strong tradition of uh, revering, respecting freedom of expression, free speech. With, with protections on it and a real sort of reluctance on the part of social media to, to limit or censor what might even be seen as hate speech or objectionable speech. Um, you know, think of Mark Zuckerberg and his, his reluctance to uh, take down uh, Holocaust denial type posts until there was such pressure that he did. I, I just wonder whether in this age of, uh, of bots and automation where things are, are just amplified so quickly, do we need to, to err more now on the side of being conservative and limiting um, some of that speech, even on a, on a norms level for, for social media companies? I'm, what, I wonder what you think about this. Anyone? Alina? Well, um, I think as Ambassador Freed, uh, who's here, uh, sometimes says, you know, bots don't have First Amendment rights. <laughs> right? um, in the United States, uh, unlike in Europe, we have freedom of speech that's quite expansive um, in, the, in, the, in the First Amendment. In Europe, there are much more restrictive uh, visions around free speech um, than there are in the United States. But I think the reality mm -hmm. is that there is a foreign element to this. And when we factor that in, it is probably a small portion of the broader sort of conspiracy, quote unquote, fake news, misinformation space, right, that's out there. That's something we will have to deal with as a society. And I think that is a generational problem as we're talking about this catch all term of media literacy, quote unquote. But what does that actually mean? You know, frankly, the things that you can do in Lithuania, you can't do in the United States. The scale question is just completely different. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a completely different school system. And if you look at any major communications revo technology revolution that our societies have undergone, it's taken centuries, in the case of the printing press, for example, decades, in the case of radio and television, for us to figure out how do we adjust and what is the role of the regulatory system, for example? What is the role of the educational system? And I think we need the 20-minute solutions to address the immediate foreign threats that are not uh, subject to the freedoms allowed by the First Amendment. And then we, we are already thinking about, I think, I see some evidence of this, about the 20-year solutions, right? Which is more about whatever we mean by civics courses or media literacy. And Facebook and Twitter, we have not really been talking about them, 
But at the end of the day, no matter how much training and education and whatever else we can mobilize, it will only go so far if the actual platforms are built uh, with a ad revenue model mm. that amplifies radical extremist views, which is exactly what these platforms are doing now, and that's what's being manipulated. So I think these are the kinds of questions we need to be thinking through, not just thinking about well, media literacy um, or uh, mm -hmm. cyber deterrence. It's really about uh, how all of these pieces plug into each other. Okay, Alina, I mean, Laura, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, to build on Alina's, yep. uh, on Alina's great point here, we've done a disservice by using this term social media because I think we've got a, a variety of different companies with business models that say a whole lot more about what the incentives are and what they are um, than, than what they will say they are, right? And Facebook, like, like Alina's pointing out, is built on ad revenue, right? It's an advertising company. And if we think of it in an advertising paradigm, um, truth in advertising, F FCC regulations, you know, we, th we think through some of the basic expectations that we have for advertisers, knowing who's behind it, knowing who's funded it. Then we have some approachable, you know, thought processes here that don't even make us cross into this world of who gets to regulate what speech, right? I mean, the, these questions of hate speech, what have you, are huge. But if we think of Facebook as an advertising company, then I think we've got some more approachable ways to, to start saying, here's, here's ways to regulate or here's ways for Facebook to start thinking through um, what does a transparent ad look like and what should they demand of, of people on it. The, the hard part is I think we're we're dealing, again, back to, back to the media environment that we're in, because I, I do think that's enormous here. Um, we're dealing with uh, a, a denigration of traditional media uh, sources, right, um, from, from a variety of sources, from the, from the president down, right? And there's a real questioning of, of what is the truth, where are your facts coming from, and what's the line between analysis and reporting? And I would love if more of the conversations around what we do in this in this short term that, that Alina's kind of scoping out here revolved around media organizations, and you tell me if I'm missing it from the Post standpoint, but where, where, where organizations like the Post, we'll just pick on Ellen's for now, um, come forward and say, you know, the reason, here's our process. Yes, mm -hmm. there's an editor, yes, it's a person. And he's, yeah. he or she's been at it you know, for, for 30 years, and here's how they make the judgments that they do. These are sort of the, the basics of what has given um, certain news organizations a lot of credibility and have a lot more to lose. But I think that uh, transparency around process is something that will um, slowly help to regain trust and show where the sort of sources and methods yeah. of legitimate organizations come into play and, and, and give people those tools to judge the fly-by-night, you know, um, US Patriot News, Eagles.com, or, you know, whatever it is that pops up um, purporting to be the, the latest and greatest fact source. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree that uh, transparency is is incredibly important to building trust, and it's sort of a cornerstone of, of what we do as journalists uh, at the mainstream media, the Washington Post, New York Times, and other places. Um, I think I'm not even sure um, we do that good a job at, at, at explaining that, for instance, there is uh, a wall between our opinion page and our news side, our editorial pages, the House editorials that run that endorse candidates or take a particular view on on, you know, on foreign policy or on trade, and then the news articles. Uh, and then beyond that, we also have people who write analysis in the news section. And we usually label it as such. But I think to the general public, sometimes all of those lines get blurred, and they might take, they see someone who's an actual outside columnist. Um, and at the Washington Post, I know the, the editorial side uh, prides itself on having a view, a range of views from the right to the left and in, in between. And people see these columns by columns and they think that that might be just part of the actual news side. And there are differences. So that's, you know, part of, I guess, media literacy, if you want. And, and that's just at the traditional mainstream media level, not to um, bring in all the new people who put up blogs without having a traditional editorial uh, process. 
And John, I know you've been wanting to say something for a while. So, yeah. uh, I, I cede ground to no one in opposing Kremlin aggression and revisionism, including in the disinformation space. But I'm very wary of efforts to use the government mm -hmm. to regulate what the Kremlin is up to within the United States. Mm -hmm. And I, in that same vein, I'm leery of saying, well, foreigners don't have First Amendment rights. Well, of course they don't if they're not in the United States. But when they speak in the United States, they should enjoy First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. Now, l let, me, let me just finish. Mm -hmm. So um, bots may not have rights, but we have to be careful if we look at the problem of bots by regulation to see what precedent it might set for more traditional speech in the United States. Uh, the, 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 the United States has an extraordinary position of free speech and of government laws designed to protect it. But we've also seen in, in recent years, both from the right and the left, serious threats to that free speech. Free speech. Anyone on an American college campus knows it comes not just from the right. Mm -hmm. So we, again, we have to be very careful about precedence. Now, Alina's point is an excellent one that we have a short-term problem and this is all very complicated, and to have a long-term fix is going to take some time and some thought. That, that, that's a fair point. But I would just be careful about taking steps which could lead us in the direction of government-regulated speech. Mm -hmm. but, but what about social media company-regulated mm -hmm. uh, Actions. So, for, for instance, Facebook taking down accounts that it knows to be uh, linked to the IRA or the Kremlin. My preference would be even there for transparency to be the answer. So let them keep the site up and let them have their big, big red thing online. This, this is brought to you by courtesy of the Kremlin. <laughs> and the same thing can be true, for example, with RT which we know is a propaganda spewing yeah. mechanism. But I would not shut it down. I, I would simply put you know, little, little signs on it. You know, you have, you have signs about, on cigarette boxes. We'll have signs on certain type of media. Right, that, that was Geisha and Alina's excellent column in, in your newspaper. <laughs> uh, Opinion. Alina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alina, what, yeah. yeah, just to share briefly since, right. since John already, thank you for plugging the article uh, that Geisha Gonzalez and I wrote in, in the post uh, about a month ago on this. I mean, I think the bigger point is that um, taken by themselves, transparency like labels that John is talking about don't work. I mean, Facebook itself experimented with this and it was a complete disaster because people actually clicked on stuff that was disputed not necessarily, you know, they can't always attribute content as we've seen in some of the disclosures that Facebook has itself put out when they took down these 80-something accounts that were, that they identified as potentially linked to Russia. The attribution is not that easy and it's become increasingly more difficult. Talk about Maskerovka that you brought up earlier. It's, it's part of the point of it. Um, and in itself, labels don't work. Cigarette labels also didn't work in themselves. Um, people actually did not smoke less because uh, cigarettes said that this was going to kill you. Just like people don't uh, not click on something because it has a red flag on it. So that kind of intervention, what we're really talking about is how do you change human behavior? Mm -hmm. How do you not just change the behavior of malicious states like Russia, China, Iran, etc., but how do you get people to act differently? And I think that takes a very different approach than just labeling something because that makes us want that thing more. <laughs> like it's sexier, it's more fun because it's bad. Um, and I think in reality, unfortunately, um, even though I agree with John on the regulatory question, um, what really worked in the tobacco industry, for example, was regulation at the end of the day. It was not the labels, it was taxes and it was regulation. And we saw the first attempt uh, by the German government uh, to use sanction Facebook Sorry. in case uh, a clearly shown fakes uh, are being uh, distributed. So I'm not sure what's the evaluation of, of that attempt uh, for now, uh, but clearly the European uh, Parliament, as, as you saw from the hearings, are uh, rather ready to, to look more attentively to Facebook's, Twitter's, and, and other companies of the scale, uh, 
uh, control and, and, and uh, the uh, regulation. But more or less, uh, we have to understand that sometimes you don't need to be in the United States in order to express opinion about what's happening in the United States <laughs> through Facebook. <laughs> Uh, see, regulation, do you think uh, um, that could Florida? that could help? Yeah. Uh, I guess the European uh, part will be one of the first ones to test it out, right. and uh, of course that's that's as, uh, as Nina told, we have a different environment. And, and if it's transatlantic, red lines, red lines yeah. are, are, are drawn a bit closer than than in the US in, in, in this respect. Laura, what would it look like for well, you? I, I, I too am in this, am in this, uh, you know, obvious camp of protect the First Amendment because because we've it's done well by us, right? And this is kind of the cornerstone of of how we operate, and it's also our massive strategic advantage over an adversary like Russia, right? So, um, you know, it's it, this isn't this isn't a you know solvable on a panel kind of problem, uh, shocker, right? But um, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, um, but I. I think we really do, the, the hate speech piece that the ambassador brings up is, is great because I do think that we are on, a, on the precipice of a slippery slope where if we, if we fall into this um, kind of cocoon of feeling like we can insulate ourselves from some of this bad stuff, Holocaust denial, other, other real icky, icky stuff that, that none of us want to see, right? Um, that that somehow will make our democracy stronger. And I think that's a fallacy. And I think it also um, it takes us a step closer to the way that Russians have approached, or the Kremlin's approached, the control of information. Um, they, they define this domain, you know, cyberspace, as an information domain. And, and, and they see it as sovereign. They see it as a place where they have the ability to control um, what the narratives are and they feel it's their duty to. And, and to use that space as such. And if, and if we start going down that road and sort of um, you know, limiting, limiting the protections that the First Amendment has, rather than having the arguments about why um, what RT is spewing is wrong or, or, or why it's not useful or what have you, if we avoid those arguments because it's harder to have the argument um, and it's easier to, to regulate the speech, then I think we have, we have just, um, you know, taken, we, we've shot our own foot in a sense. Okay, yeah. Okay. So just very quickly, I think we're having two separate conversations here. There's one conversation about First Amendment free speech rights, which I actually think we all agree on. <laughs> and there's a separate conversation about the role of government in regulating private companies, um, not in, in terms of limiting or censoring free speech, but, for example, it should not be the case that when you do a Google search uh, for Syria, that the first top, the, in the top five, you get RT hits. That should not be the case. I don't think Google or Facebook or Twitter or any of these companies um, should delete content. I actually think that's the wrong way mm -hmm. because that doesn't allow us to actually know how disinformation works on these platforms. Mm -hmm. But they should mute it. They should not prioritize it. And they will take you know, actual revenue hits for us, Facebook has begun to see, and so has Twitter, because they will have to deal with that lack of you know, increasing user numbers or people getting the, the dirty, sexy content they want that's actually disinformation or misinformation. So I think there's two separate conversations happening here that I just wanted to separate out. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Or not? And, uh, close to that, uh, coming back to what I, I told about countries saying no to certain investments, seeing the power of Google, Facebook, Twitter, and comparing it to any country that we have, it's the same question. Is everything business to uh, Twitter, uh, Google, and Facebook? Is it OK <coughs> to have ads from Assad in the five uh, top positions. This, if that's moral business, that's fine. But uh, I'm, I, I'm, sh I'm certain that uh, no uh, democratic uh, countries will invest as much into public relations as non-democratic countries. <laughs> and the whole of NATO will never buy that many ads as Russia does. 
Um, I, we have only a few minutes left. I have a couple more questions, and um, I guess one of them is, uh, I think, Lena, you mentioned, or Laura, that the, from the president on down, uh, we're, we're seeing you know, some divisive messages. How do you counter uh, Russian disinformation when the president himself is, is uh, publicly skeptical that Russia interfered in the last election? And, and is the president's Twitter feed, with its 55 million followers, itself a form of influence operation? <laughs> Ambassador. Yeah, Ambassador, Ambassador Herbst. <laughs> there, there's no question that um, President Trump's Twitter feed has been a major political tool for him um, with, with serious impact. Uh, there are, politicians are always going to operate to enhance their influence. And in a democratic society, that's, that's to be expected. And that's not a problem. Uh, what is a question is whether or not, as people seek to enhance their influence, whether they are willing to abuse news, uh, censor news. And I think this is a, a legitimate question. I think that, again, we've seen threats to freedom of speech um, from all corners of the United States lately. And we should be very sensitive to that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question that this president is unique. In, in many different ways. But I think the one way in which he's not unique is that he seeks to speak to his constituency as directly as possible. Previous US presidents have sought to do that as well. He's the first one to use Twitter um, to that effect. He's been very good at it. This is how he's a very savvy politician. You may disagree with him, you may not like him, but he's very good at being a politician. And I think we're, again, we're just at the beginning. If Twitter didn't exist 10 years ago. So we're just at the very beginning of trying to understand what this means, not just for our information environment, for our political environment. And I don't think what President Trump is doing now is going to be the exception. Mm -hmm. I think this is the new normal. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. OK. Well, I'd like to just um, end by asking in a lightning round to go down the line and have each one of you give me your top sort of takeaway as, in terms of a, a, a solution that you think or, or that you would recommend to get at any aspect of the problem here that we've talked about um, just as a, a result of our discussion. You want to start? Well, one, again, I, I would stress yeah. transparency. Okay. But as part of that, I would urge political leaders in this country and in Western Europe to call a spade a spade. That what the Kremlin is up to is to revise the international order. It's a serious danger, which we have the strength to deal with as long as we understand it and are resolute. Uh, despite the title of this panel being about the Kremlin, I would say we can't just think about this as, as the Kremlin's activity. We're dealing with a set of issues that a variety of different government and non-government actors are going to try to use in different ways. And it will take a, a thoughtful um, you know, set of, of concerted efforts across the public and private sector for us to think about the way that we want to redefine security in this space. Is that uh, the first task for us all is to agree what are the measures applied against us and to look at the strategy that Russia has and then to create the tools in order to stop the strategy from being implemented, not coping with tools one by one. No whack a mole game. <laughs> uh, that was going to be my talking point as well. Um, I think from Two, if I can have two things, yes. from a governmental perspective, what I would really like to see, and this is not just specific to the US, is an actual strategic vision of what we're trying to do with Russia. Uh, right now, we have tactics, we have techniques, we have policies. We have no vision of what, where we're trying to get to. And I would like to see that from a governmental perspective. That will go a long way in setting the, the more short-term solutions. And the other piece, um, when John mentioned transparency, um, I would like to see more algorithmic transparency mm -hmm. um, when it comes to these tech companies. And this is their intellectual property, right? But we have no idea, really. We don't really know how our own information, why we're talking about being you know, savvy, critical consumers. But the reality is that it is outside of our control to a certain extent, the manipulation of our digital online information space. And I want to know more about how that space is being manipulated for me. 
Well, thank you very much. I think this has been a really an, an enlightening hour of discussion. And um, we're going to have a brief coffee break um, right now. And then the next session will begin at 2.35. Thank you.